All right, everyone. <clears throat> this is uh, a brief and lighthearted lecture about Japanese ukiyo-e woodcut printing. <clears throat> ukiyo-e can be translated as the floating world, um, but the prints in this lecture, as well as the many, many thousands of other prints in the tradition, <clears throat> um, are kind of known as ukiyo-e or prints, pictures of the floating world. The word floating world, uh, ukiyo, comes from a Buddhist term originally describing the present sorrow, sorrowful world of pain in contrast to the heavenly world of paradise. In the second half of the 17th century, the usage of the word shifted. Instead of being written with the character meaning sad, it was written with the character for floating, and thus floating world was born. And its meaning moved from one of pessimism about the everyday to one of optimism, even hedonism, about the pleasurable world of the here and now. The classic definition of ukiyo, quoted above, stands at the beginning of the extraordinary floating world culture that developed and flourished in the Edo period, which is historically defined from 1603 to 1868 under the military dictatorship of the Tokugawa shogun. This culture was expressed in the lifestyle of the leading players in the floating world, and it survives in the vivid imprint of their ephemeral existence in the poems, novels, plays, paintings, and prints that they left behind. <clears throat> so the culture of the floating world in Edo, Japan, is not just the prints, but the prints take on center stage because it is the popular mass media that documents and is central to that culture. So ukiyo-e culture includes kabuki theater, it includes literature and poetry, it includes clothing, and many other aspects of life many other aspects of pursuing pleasure. But because all of those were documented within the tradition of prints, prints really take a central role in that culture. They were also valued for their own right. They were from the beginning meant to be a populist and popular art form, but they were also nonetheless incredibly sophisticated weaving literary and poetic references, uh, subtle symbolism, drawing on a rich cultural history uh, within Japanese life. Likewise, in this period, the rise of ukiyo-e prints reflects a growing middle class of people that have a little bit of extra time and extra money to actually pursue pleasure in the legally established and licensed pleasure district of Edo. Um, and so the prints really reflect that. So it is a s complex and significant community of humans who want to enjoy their lives and who have a little bit of leisure via money and time to create culture. And that's often what happens, is interesting movements within the arts are made possible by such uh, affluence and leisure. So the rest of this lecture is not going to, it's not an art history lecture. I'm not going to have all the info for all of the images that I'm going to show you. I really just want to focus on the formal qualities that really um, are associated with the Japanese ukiyo-e print tradition. 
because in the project that you're doing for your intro to printmaking class, uh, those are the qualities that I want you to really focus on and have instilled in your image that you make. Um, because of the nature of Ukiyo-e, it really reflected kind of all aspects of life um, from the very dramatic to the very serious to the most poetic to religious to landscape to people, but also to kind of comic relief. Um, uh, way back in the day, there was a Tumblr blog that was devoted to cats in ukiyo-e. And I remember being very excited when I discovered that Tumblr account. Um, cats appear many times in ukiyo-e, many, you know, oftentimes with humans, but a lot of times just a series of cats alone. So they were definitely fascinated by cats. Um, they, they did a lot of prints of them. These are all printed from woodcuts, and they're all, well, not all, but many are multicolored, which means there is a separate block for each color. So in this one, this kind of desaturated salmon color here was one block. The gray was another block. The black was a third. The red is a fourth. Um, so many blocks to produce the, the range here. And there's a, a more saturated orange that goes on top of that kind of, uh, kind of pinkish salmon color. So you too will be making for your project one block per color. Sometimes um, ukiyo-e prints would reproduce images of very successful and famous drama uh, that had been performed. Very often it would focus on specific actors playing specific roles. And so f even what we today call fan art had a huge role in ukiyo-e prints, but because of the sophistication of their symbolism and references and lay poetic layering, um, they were still quite rich. They would also um, illustrate stories, mythologies. So this is a is a is a leg a Japanese legend where a um, a fisherman, I believe, uh, a male fisherman, takes notice of this young woman who never seems to eat. And he says to himself that that would be a great wife because she won't um, cost me much money in, in eating so much. And so he marries her. And uh, one day, he, after leaving the house to go fish, he is he's suspecting that his wife is eating while he's gone. And so he circles back to the house to spy on her and he realizes that um, while he's gone, she's eating these rice balls, but not with her normal mouth behind her hair on the back of her head. She has a second mouth and she is eating the rice balls into that mouth. And so this is a kind of a a sort of a Japanese femme fatale character. Um, uh, notice how Japanese ukiyo-e, but also Japanese work in visual work in general, uses isometric space, particularly within the architecture. So if this were Renaissance perspective, these horizontal lines of the architectural panes would be approaching each other as they get closer to a vanishing point as part of the rules of Renaissance perspective. But they're not in this representation. So in real space, these mullions would be parallel. And in this isometric depiction of that space, they are still parallel, whereas they would not be parallel 
in, per, in Renaissance perspective, they would be diminishing towards the same vanishing point. So one of the formal qualities that, that distinguishes not exclusively Japanese visual work, but certainly within the Japanese tradition, is the use of isometric space. And we'll be talking a little bit more about that in the lecture. Notice, too, how cropping and overlapping work. Um, a third item I'd like you to pay close attention to is how patterning is used. So, for instance, right here in the clothing, notice that that flower motif, you see this line that comes down here, and that line describes the edge of a fold in the fabric. But notice that the flower continues on either side of that line, even though if we were actually looking at that fold in the fabric, the pattern of the flower would be interrupted and wouldn't be seen as contiguous. That's a common technique in Japanese prints where the pattern on the clothing is used. So you'll have the simultaneous existence of a line describing the edge of a fold, but also the flatness of the pattern. And that results in this interesting dialogue between flat and dimensional. That is to say, the depicting of a three-dimensional space while also reinforcing the flatness of ink on paper. This is a book cover. Of course, in Japanese, you not only read top to bottom traditionally, but also right to left. So this is the front cover of a book, which means the spine is on the right. And this is the distinctive Japanese and Chinese binding uh, of books. This is a woodcut used to decorate the cover. You see, I think, some birds and some cloud forms printed in a very, very desaturated black to make it just this subtle gray. And then that red is a red piece of paper that's been glued on there. You saw single leaf prints in the, market, in the marketplace in Ukiyo, but you also saw huge amounts of the woodcut prints being put into books. Fish, just like cats, are another really common motif. Um, here you see a very explicit kind of S or figure eight approach to composition, um, where the viewer's eye is very clearly but beautifully guided through the composition within a figure eight. Look at the really wonderful use of knockout, the way the water here is in front of the fish, and so the on the blocks that make up the fish, the fish was carved away here so that, so knocked out, so that the water would appear to be in front of the fish there, but the fish fin is in front of the water here, and the head is in front of the water. This fin, too, is in front of there. So thus, the sense of S, or figure eight, is not simply within the lateral space of the paper. It is also implied in a deeper front-to-back space where this fish is not just curving left to right, but back to front. The water as well is, is implying that this part of the water is further away from us than this part. So the S is three-dimensional. The figure eight is three-dimensional. Cortesians were often depicted. You know, again, this is a really interesting example of the patterning here existing with lines that describe an edge of a fold. It's a beautiful uh, blend, which is incredibly common in the Japanese tradition. And this is also an, a great example of overlapping. Look at the way her torso overlaps this banner in the background. This smaller text block overlaps that larger one. Look at the way the image as a whole is cropping, I think, this lamp here. 
and you see just that little bit of pole. Notice how the lamp pole and, and this element helps activate this negative space right here. Notice too how the figure is done in a kind of a Japanese version of contrapposto where the lower portion of the body is facing to the right, the torso turns, and the head is facing to the left, which again references the possibility of a kind of subtle S-curve to the composition. This is an example of a specific actor <clears throat> playing a specific role in a specific kabuki drama. It's, a, it's zoomed in on the actor's face. The actor is wearing heavy makeup as part of the role. This element here in the bottom right corner is part of the actor's costume. It's an incredibly dramatic composition uh, sh expressing a lot of the emotion in th from that role and that moment in the drama. S many of the examples that you see coming out of the ukiyo-e tradition could be quite humble. They, you know, it, it, like in all other respects, also technically you'd see the full range. So this one is technically of a very high quality. Uh, it's many blocks. They're well printed. They're well carved. Uh, this one, however, is not bad. It's just not quite as accomplished. Um, it's got fewer blocks, so there's a sort of simplification of what, how many colors are going to be used and, and what needs to be, re, you know, readable or carried within the image. They did spend a lot of time carving all of this text and again just like any relief technique if you want something to print positive you have to carve around carve away the wood around that mark. So they, they did go to great pain to preserve the calligraphic nature of this calligraphy by carving around it very precisely. But there's only three blocks in this one, blue, green, and black. They would often use triptychs because it was easier to print a smaller size, but in wanting a larger image, they would create the triptych uh, to allow one panel of the triptych to be printed at a time, um, but put together. And that also sometimes would be in a book and it would be, un it you would f unfold it inside the book. Um, many stories, legends, you know, be veering from mythology to actual historical stories too. This is a scan from uh, a museum in Japan. Um, all of the text was in Japanese and I was just kind of clicking around until I found the scans on there, the digital scans in their archive. This is a, is a scan from a page spread of a book where there's a, an image that unfolds from the book. So what you're seeing here is the image before it is unfolded. I just was sort of amused by the, the peculiarity of that head sticking up and the lower portion of a body there, but the whole missing chunk between those two that we're not seeing in that scan. It's a really beautiful, uh, this could be a portrait of a Cortesian. Um, this profusion of fabric and pattern, the branches with the leaves and the flowers, her face is looking up to the right. This keeps our attention from zooming off the edge of the image. It also activates this negative space. So we really get pulled around in interesting ways. Notice too that another example of the line of a fold of a fabric, but the 
pattern motif continues right through that line. Here's another lower quality one that was probably made for more popular consumption for, you know, and also produced at a lower cost. Um, it is, I, 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 I'm, there's a lot I don't know about this, but it's like a mice person, a mice, a mouse human kind of, and then smaller mice skimpering around. Um, this guy seems consume, concerned about his pa folded papers and scroll here. Um, and maybe the small mice are eating the books and the scrolls. It looks like they're es escaping with pieces of paper there. And you can see the quality of the printing is not as good in this. Um, there is a limited number of blocks. Keep in mind that with the, the ukiyo-e printing industry was huge and complex. So there were people who um, only carved the blocks. There were people that only printed the blocks. The work was very often commissioned by a publisher who would finance the whole project. The publisher would commission an artist, and the artist would be paid for the imagery. The imagery would be given to the people that would carve the blocks. And then once the blocks are carved, they, the blocks would go to the people that would print them. And then the prints would be bound into books if that's the final form that they were going to be in. So there was a division of labor that allowed this industry to produce very large numbers in often very high quality. But very few of these, if any, uh, are produced by a single individual. So it's a different model. It is, from what we would think of as artistic production today, quite different. Um, it was very much collaborative, but under the strict direction of the publisher and who was financing it. Here's a late one, so late 19th century and right at the end of the whole Edo period. And uh, you can sort of start to see actually some of the influence from the, from the world outside of Japan. Um, just starting to make itself impacted on Japanese visual culture. This is a cloth kind of sail or banner form that is being moved by a gust of wind. This is an old figure whose um, rib cage is, show, is so um, exaggerated there in the open bit of kimono. His arm is up, his hand is open, his, he seems to be yelling or gesturing as part of the gust of wind. He's got old armor sitting here. I don't know what that is. But uh, really wonderful dynamism. Here's a very low technical quality one. You know, you see lots of kind of this push of the ink, which is usually um, a sign of mediocre printing. Uh, however, it's still very much within the populist tradition, and there's still wonderful things about this. You know, again, look at the use of knockout. This ray of energy or light that's coming from this female figure, this male figure was knocked out of that area to imply that this light or energy that's emitting from her is moving in front of him. So it's really coming, but she's standing much farther away than he is from us. So this is moving towards the viewer very dramatically, even though this yellow form here comes kind of in front of that. Snow is also often shown as is rain. Um, the use of negative space, the use of non-printing area as positive space are both really sophisticated topics within the ukiyo-e tradition. So where you see this color here, that is just the paper. 
So snow is often depicted as nothing printing there. <laughs> it's just the white of the paper. Um, and that's true of this oarsman's outfit, hat, all the snow, anywhere where the snow is accumulating, like the roof and the treetops. Um, but it's also true of this text block here. And it's true for portions of the umbrellas, as well as the boat. Each of these white dots for the falling snowflakes are also carved out of the blocks to sh allow the paper to show through and to, to imply the snowflakes. It's a really beautiful way of leading the viewer's eye the way this, you know, this figure is looking left and we also don't see the face of the oarsman but we understand that the oarsman is looking this direction in the upper left plus the boat is pointing that direction. So we just have this nice zigzag through the image as we get up here and then back down. Domestic scenes of everyday life. These are children playing a game. Here's a child rolling on the ground. Some of the parts of the game have spilled. It seems that the playing may have descended into a bit of raucousness. The children are shown at the edge of an architectural structure where they're sitting on the floor, but you have open windows and you have one of these panels. And again, this shows you some of the isometric depiction of architectural space. Look at the cropping too, not only the cropping of one figure in front of another, but also figure in front of architectural form and then how the architectural form crops yet another view. So our glimpse of the natural world outside of the home, this tree, and I'm not sure if that's a stump or a, of a, 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 ba a bowl that would be like a fountain or something. But those things are cropped, and you will often see these windows within the larger composition. So this is like a composition within a composition. And that's very common in how they would crop. You know, in some of these, you can really see the power that the ukiyo-e prints had as an influence in, on European painting in the second half of the 19th century. You know, I would compare this to paintings by Manet that were depicting um, the new industrial urban environment of Paris. So train yards, fences at the edge of industrial zones, bridges, over the train tracks. So showing shallow spaces that yet give glimpses of deeper space, just exactly as the way this one does. So you have this fence on a kind of bridge, I think it's a bridge, um, where these three figures are sitting and we have this cropping of that view, but then through that fence, we see into the distant space more figures and little bits of other information like that little house there, another bridge that's going over water. Amazing subtlety uh, is possible, particularly with the technical aspects of how ukiyo-e was made. Um, you know, the two layers of this green kind of semi-transparent screen here is really amazing. The cropping of that, the composition, the way this energy brings us down here and the way this brings us back into the figure and back up. The subtlety of the colors. Notice the nice range of saturation from very saturated to very light, very subtle. 
So it's not like it's a million colors, but it's really effective use of color. Look at these little blends of little bits of blue there, there, there as part of the fabric that she's wearing. Here in this one, it goes from this slight lavender to no color to green. It's really amazingly subtle and beautiful. Again, this one, low tech, probably an anonymous artist. This was probably made in huge numbers for very popular consumption, not a particularly famous one. And yet there are qualities in this that are, very, that are the same as the qualities within the masterworks that we are looking at. So overlap and how, you know, just simple tricks like these oval forms on the tree some are behind a branch, some are in front of a branch. So there's like, there's a branch in front of one, here's a branch in front of one, and there's other ones where there's the oval form in front of the branch. So just a subtle but very effective uh, suggestion of space. There's a nice range of saturation from saturated, saturated, desaturated, desaturated, desaturated. There's even that little bit of green in that, those leaves of that element, that flower right there. And another cat wearing a red bandana sort of thing with a bell on it. I have no idea what's going on with this one. This might be like a part of a puppet show where this is the lamp with the flame that would be behind a screen. And then this is a flat silhouette that's used to project a shadow between the lamp and the screen. So the audience would be on the other side of the screen um, seeing the shadow cast by this silhouette. Sumo wrestlers appear in a number of ukiyo-e prints. This particular example is not very sophisticated technically. It's probably by an anonymous artist. But sumo wrestling was part of the, the whole culture of the pursuit of pleasure, just like kabuki theater. And so they were also imaged in ukiyo-e prints. Stories of samurai and legends figure big. This is right at the end of the Edo period, right before Japan actually opens up. Like legally they, they had made it so it was illegal for Japanese to leave Japan and it was illegal for non-Japanese to come to Japan. And right at the end of the 19th century, Japan is kind of forced to open up to the world and start to trade. And, uh, and that kind of marks the end of the Edo period. And you have this Japanese push at that point to modernize in almost every way. And part of that push to modernize uh, unfortunately also has an abandonment of many traditional aspects of Japanese culture. And, and so that's one of the reasons why in this project I'm specifying that your examples that you're starting from, the original Japanese ukiyo prints that you're starting from, must come from that Edo period. Look at the rope pattern on his outfit and how it moves around and how it interacts with the lines of the folds of the fabric. It's just really beautiful and brilliant. I'm not sure if this is one of those slightly infamous, there's a, an occupation of pearl harvesters, pearl divers that are always women and and they free dive, which means they're just holding their breath. I'm not sure if this is one of those women, but she's obviously at the coast. 
you're seeing sea creatures, two octopuses, a crab. She's tying her hair back. Um, you see kind of the rocks and maybe also, I'm not sure if that's also seaweed. Um, it's a beautiful image, many blocks, many colors. It's a great elephant. This one, low tech, probably an anonymous artist. Um, made very much for popular consumption. This leopard is just so freaking charming. He seems so delighted by this bird and distracted. But also, I just love the expression on his face. I love the patterning of the spots. I love the layering of these patterns from first the leopard and then the vertical red bars and then the hexagonal panes here. So this layering of pattern. Very little idea what's going on here. I just sort of am charmed by this. These lines here are uh, lines eaten of pa lines of paper eaten by worms so worms are one of the downfalls of of works on paper um, so those lines are not part of the image um, this definitely did come from a book you can see the framing lines so this would have been one page of a page spread and we're only seeing one page. We're not seeing the other side of the page spread. Two women uh, going to bed. Really interesting cropping. This element, this might be a folding screen here. It's beautiful the way they, the two women are looking at each other. So that is activating this empty space between the two rich, rich patterning in the clothing. There is a full page spread of two cats confronting each other on a rooftop. And you see the tiles from the roof. It may be one of those structures that is not a full house. It's like a gate where you have two posts and then connecting the post is like a mini roof. That's kind of what it looks like to me. Look at the use of cropping. Look at the S curvature of that cat and the picking up of this one and the way the two cats are looking at each other facing off and how that activates the negative space here. Notice how this central location to the whole image is empty. That's also common how empty spaces are framed to help activate them. From the same book as the two cats. Same book, single page of a page spread, bats. It's another sumo wrestler with his pipe. and a mother with her baby. I'm not sure what these elements are. This looks like some kind of drum. This is some kind of cast bronze container or bowl or something. Really rich patterning, carefully, very, very carefully carved for her kimono. This is the same actor playing the same role in the same kabuki drama that you saw earlier but instead of zooming in on the face we're seeing the full figure notice that the torso is facing the to the right even though the face is facing to the left and again that's kind of this almost this japanese version of contrapposto as 
translate it into a flat graphic medium. It's a bit earlier. It's kind of slightly low tech, but still exhibiting many of the common themes. <clears throat> the pursuit of poetry, the beauty of <clears throat> objects, this fan that would have been produced by a woodblock print being stiffened and mounted to the holder. In fact, the tradition of making fans uh, by printing wood blocks becomes such a big deal that the fan shapes that they actually quit cutting out the print to make the fan. So the shape of the fan becomes an established style for leaving as a print. It's really fascinating. Again, this is sort of like almost a synopsis of what it what people would want out of enjoying the ukiyo-e life that is to say the enjoyment of literature and poetry books <coughs> music good clothing leisure she's reclined i'm not sure what's sticking out of her mouth she is well dressed cared for beautiful she's got makeup on um, so this is kind of maybe the ideal, an expression of the ideal uh, leisurely pursuit of beauty in the ukiyo-e tradition. Low-tech, anonymous artist. There's some mediocre trap going on. There, the colors are almost a little bit garish. They're not quite as sophisticated and artful, but at the same time, it's still a very charming image showing kind of an everyday life of joy uh, where one figure is kneeling down so that another child can stand on their back and reach up to the, to the maybe cherry blossoms. So this would be the beginning of spring and winter. Again, the snow being the only place that you're seeing the white of the paper. Look at this really subtle gray to help give it just enough tone that the white of the paper pops. This is probably another <clears throat> specific actor playing a specific role. Images within images. Layers of engagement, too, in almost all the works we've seen, there's, there's text. Text plays a role in ukiyo-e in ways that no Western visual tradition has ever really done. Um, they are not only using literary references and poetry within the visual arts, but they are incorporating the calligraphic visual qualities of the writing perfectly with the rest of the image. So we can view these as equal players within the composition, the formal compositional structure. So from our purposes, we can say, oh, this is just as important and powerful as this branch in here, as the detail in the figure. They are all contributing to the overall visual effect. These things help activate negative space between the figure and them. So you have this beautiful arbor structure with a flower plant growing on it and a woman walking underneath it. Here you have more of the lines being left by worms. That might be a, t a pouch that's used to hold tobacco and a pipe. birds and flowers. A 
It's a woman reading a book. There's lots of text here to read, text here. <clears throat> here is a typical Japanese ghost that is scaring the heck out of these two guys who are falling off a dock into the water. They're so scared. So maybe she's reading this story that is being depicted here. Notice the kind of weird face hung from this pole right here and the sort of face, non-face, that's left on the figure. Japanese ghost stories, by the way, are amazing. Um, <clears throat> I'm not really enough of authority to tell you that much, but uh, I do know that the Japanese ghost stories are quite rich in complexity. Landscape, often celebrating specific views uh, of specific roads or travels or famous and important locations. Notice the white of the paper used for the cloud. So this is the white of the paper. And it's knocked out of all the other blocks. So here, the cloud form is knocked out of the gray mountain. But here, it's knocked out of the sky. And it's printed perfectly. So we read this as a contiguous positive form in front of both of those. And the cloud form reaching up fingers into the lower portions of this mountainous landscape. Here's an example of a fan, but instead of having the woodcut print being cut down and, and made stiff into a fan, it's left as a print. So again, that evolved out of making the fans, people falling in love with the prints that were made just as prints, but made for the fan. And then eventually you get artists making images that are intended to be left as prints, but in the form of the fan. So the fan becomes this sort of vehicle for um, making these images, in this case flowers, which is not uncommon, which is almost like part of a still life, which relates to that ephemerality that even it relates to similar still life traditions in, in European traditions where even if the still life is celebrating the beauty of a specific moment like ripe fruit and, and beautiful flowers and such, somewhere in there is also the reality of death. And so in, cel in the celebration of the ephemeral and the beauty of the moment, there is implicit in that that death is ever present and that any of all of this beauty will disappear even as it's replaced by other things of beauty. That's it.